الدينيون رجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين بارئ الخلائق أجمعين باعث الأنبياء والمرسلين والصلاة والسلام والتحية والإكرام على سيدنا ونبينا وحبيب قلوبنا وطبيب نفوسنا وشفيع ذنوبنا بالقاسم محمد اللهم صل على وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين المظلومين الذين أذهب الله عنهم الرجس وطهرهم تطهيرا أما بعد فقد قال الله سبحانه تبارك وتعالى في محكم كتابه المجيد وفرقانه الحميد وقوله الحق بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم اتل ما اوحي اليك من الكتاب واقم الصلاه ان الصلاه تنهى عن الفحشاء والمنكر ولذكر الله اكبر والله يعلم ما تصنعون صدق الله العلي العظيم صلوات على محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم Verse 45 of Surah Al-Ankabut One of the very well-known verses of the Quran Which you have heard many times A verse that talks about two things One, about Allah's communication with us And the second, about our communication with Allah Azza wa Jal Allah's communication with us in the form of the Wahi the Quran that he has revealed where when we recite the Quran it is the words of Allah Azza wa Jal that we hear and we listen to it is a great blessing and it is a great miracle of Allah Azza wa Jal that from the time of the Holy Prophet until the day of Qiyamah whenever you want to listen to your Lord and your Creator the Quran is in front of you how unfortunate we are that many times we do not take advantage of this great blessing. When we talk about the wahi of Allah Azza wa Jal to human beings, we have to realize that there are two kinds of wahi. There is wahi ar-Rahmani, that is wahi from Allah Azza wa Jal. And there is wahi ar-Shaytani also. Which is the wahi of shaitan. وَإِنَّ الشَّيَاطِينَ لَيُوحُونَ إِلَىٰ أَوْلِيَائِهِمْ Even the shayateen, they send their wahi on their awliya, on their friends. So we must realize that wahi is not only from Allah Azza wa Jal. Even shaitan has his own types of wahi. And that's why the scholars say, When... A thought comes in your mind to do something good, then you should know that that is Wahi ar Rahmani from Allah Azza wa Jal. But when the idea and the thought comes in your mind to do something evil, then you should know that this is Wahi ar Shaytani. And as far as Quran is concerned, when the Quran is being recited, of course we know that they are adab. There are etiquettes that we have to take care of as far as the recitation of the Qur'an is concerned and also as far as listening to the recitation of the Qur'an is concerned. We know for example that the Qur'an itself tells us in Surah Al-A'raf وَإِذَا قُرِئَ الْقُرْآنِ فَاسْتَمِعُوا لَهُ وَأَنْصِتُوا لَعَلَّكُمْ تُرْحَمُونَ When the Qur'an is being recited you must remain silent and listen to the recitation of the Qur'an. Some of the ulama say that it is wajib to be silent when the Qur'an is being recited. Wujub. Ayatullah Jawadi Amuli says this also includes hadith. Because if you believe that the Prophet does not speak anything but what Allah reveals to him, وَمَا يَنْطِقُ عَنِ الْهَوَىٰ 
in huwa illa wahyun yuha then it means that the words of the prophet also have this same type of holy and sacred nature that when the hadith is being recited also you should be quiet and you should listen to it so the verse talks about two things it talks about the communication of allah to us which is quran which is wahi and our communication to allah which is salah and dua this verse is well known for its definition and its description of salah what is the purpose of salah inna salata tanha anil fahsha'i wal munkar salah is that thing which the ahadith which have come both in the sunni books and in the shia books tell us that it is like that spring of water which is outside your home that you go five times a day and wash yourself in that spring will there be any dirt remaining on you no it is impossible for a person who takes bath five times a day to still be dirty that is what salah is and therefore in order to gauge the efficacy of salah the effectiveness of salah you have to see whether really does it take you away from sins or not if you are a person who recites salah who prays your salah and still commits sins then you know there's a problem with that salah and that is why the ulama said that there is a difference between your prayer being sahih and being maqbool if you follow all the rules that are written in the tawdihul masail and you pray your salah with all the correct rules your salah might be sahih might be correct but if it does not take you away from sins if it was not prayed with that khushu then it is not maqbool it is not accepted by allah how do you know whether your salah is accepted when you keep away from fahsha and munkar so many of us unfortunately our salah is such that it may be sahih but whether it is maqbool or not we have to gauge ourselves seeing whether we keep away from fahsha and munkar this is as far as the salah is concerned one last point about salah we don't say qara'tu salah i recited salah in english we say i recited my prayers in farsi even they say man namaz khandam that means i read my prayers i recited i read gujarati you say hu namaz pairo which is the same thing parwan or reciting but uh, it is not the case in arabic we don't say qara'tu salah i read the prayer no aqamtu salah iqamatu salah means establishing the prayers it's different from reading the prayers you establish the prayer you will not find anywhere in the quran it says qara'tu salah or iqra salatak no it is iqamatu salah which is establishing why because as salatu amudu din prayer is the pillar of religion it holds up the religion it is not a matter of reciting when you pray there is an effect to it it validates all your good deeds it validates your belief it validates your being a muslim and therefore if a person says i am a muslim and does not pray then there is a doubt in that type of islam what type of islam is that way it doesn't have the pillar which holds up the faith salatu amududdin in the next verse allah says wala tujadilu ahla alkitab illa billati hiya ahsan illa alladhina zalamu minhum wa qulu amanna billadhi unzila ilayna wa unzila ilaykum wa ilahuna wa ilahukum wahidun wa nahnu lahu muslimun how do you deal with those who are not Muslims, who are Ahlul Kitab? How do you debate with them? Jidal, as we had mentioned, Jidal is different from Burhan. Jidal in Arabic means to debate with someone. Wajadiluhum billati hiya ahsan. Use 
a good way of talking to these people. What does it mean? First of all, let us know what is the difference between Jidal and Burhan. And then we'll come to the type of Jidal that is being referred to here. Jidal is that kind of debate and that kind of argument which is done with another person. You don't do Jidal with yourself or with your nafs or with your mind. No. Jidal is done with another person or another party or another group. Burhan is something that you can give someone else or you can give yourself also. You can make yourself satisfied also with Burhan. There's a difference. Burhan, you can use it on yourself. Jidal, you cannot use it on yourself. That is the difference between Jidal and Burhan. Now, when, when Allah Azza wa Jal says, Illa billati hiya ahsan, what does it mean? When you are debating with the Ahl Kitab, make sure that it is in a good way. What do you mean by in a good way? There are two meanings. One, the things that you say have to be good, have to be polite, have to be respectful. And two, the way in which you say them, the presentation also has to be good, has to be respectful. Has to be polite. So the content of what you say and the manner in which you say. Both of these things have to be good for this to be correct. When you say, وَجَادِلُهُمْ بِالَّتِي هِيَ أَحْسَنْ It means even if somebody smiles and tells you off. Somebody is smiling and he is abusing you verbally. The content of what he is saying is very bad. It hurts you, but he smiles. So he's presenting it in a nice way. He's putting the poison in a nice dish, in a colorful plate and giving it to you. It is still poison. So, وَجَادِلُمْ بِالَّتِي أَحْسَنْ means say it. Say the right thing, the good thing, and say it correctly, nicely. This is how we have to deal with the Ahl al-Kitab. What do we tell them? We tell them that, look, you are Ahl al-Kitab and we are Muslims. We have certain things which are common between us. Look, we believe in what has been revealed to us and what has been revealed to you. Muslims also believe in Injil, in the Bible. We also believe in Taurat, in the Torah. Of course, we say that that which they have today is not the original. There has been Tahrib. But we believe. We believe in their prophets. We believe in their books. We have so many common terms. And that is why this famous verse, which we all know from Surah Al Imran, verse number 64. Ya ahl al kitab. تَعَالَوْا إِلَىٰ كَلِمَةٍ سَوَاءٍ بَيْنَنَا وَبَيْنَكُمْ أَنْ لَا نَعْبُدَ إِلَّا اللَّهِ وَلَا نُشْرِكَ بِهِ شَيْئًا وَلَا يَتَّخِذَ بَعْضُنَا بَعْضًا أَرْبَابًا مِنْ دُونِ اللَّهِ These are just common terms. All those who believe in the books, all those who believe in the divine revelations, they believe in these things. They believe in God. Why can we not come to common terms? This is the method that Allah teaches us in the Quran to deal with the Ahl al-Kitab. However, there is an exception. There is one group you will never be able to talk with. There is one group you will never be able to reason with. No matter how politely you approach them, no matter how correct your words will be, how politically correct your approach is, these people will not listen. They are hard-headed, they are stubborn-headed. These are from the Al Kitab. They will not, not listen. Of course, we know from our own Islamic tradition, there are certain individuals like this. There are certain groups like this, there are certain sects like this that they do not want to listen. Even if you talk to them politely and you debate with them, they don't want to listen. So Allah Azza wa says, look, those people, don't worry about them, you leave them. Those who are ready to discuss with you, you discuss with them. Those who do not want to listen, those who are oppressors, leave them. The next verse, verse number 47, 
Allah Azza wa Jal says, وَكَذَلِكَ أَنزَلْنَا إِلَيْكَ الْكِتَابِ فَالَّذِينَ آتَيْنَاهُمُ الْكِتَابَ يُؤْمِنُونَ بِهِ وَمِنْ هَاُولَاءِ مَنْ يُؤْمِنُ بِهِ وَمَا يَجْحَدُ بِآيَاتِنَا إِلَّا الْكَافِرُونَ O Prophet, we have sent you this book. Those from the Ahlul Kitab who listen to it and they have Iman and they have clean hearts, when they hear your words, they will accept. They will believe in you, O Prophet. وَمِنْ هَاُولَىٰ also, and from these people, meaning the Mushrikeen of Makkah, even from these Mushrikeen, some will believe in you. They will leave their shirk and they will follow you. Only one group of people will be stubborn in their disbelief and these are the Kafirun. وَمَا يَجْحَدُ بِآيَاتِنَا إِلَّا الْكَافِرُونَ Those who are stubborn, they are the Kafirun. Kafir in the Holy Quran has come with many meanings. Even those who don't give thanks to Allah, they are known as the Kafirun. Because the opposite of shukr is kufr. The opposite of iman is kufr. So kufr has more than one meaning. In verse 48, Allah Azza wa Jal says, وَمَا كُنْتَ تَتْلُوا مِنْ قَبْلِهِ مِنْ كِتَابٍ وَلَا تَخُطُّهُ بِيَمِينِكَ إِذَنْ لَرْتَابَ الْمُبْطِلُونَ O Prophet, you never used to write anything with your hand. You never used to read anything. You never used to write anything. Because if you used to do these things, then... Those who are mubtilun, those who are skeptics, they would find an excuse to doubt you. There is a big discussion about the meaning of the word ummi. When you say the Prophet was Nabiyun ummi, what do, what do you mean? An Nabiy al ummi. Does it mean the Prophet? Of course, the meaning is the Prophet never used to read and write from this verse. He never used to read, he never used to write. The ulama say the fact that he never used to read and he never used to write does not mean he did not know how to read and write. That's a different story. One person doesn't know how to read and write. One person does not read and write. There's a difference. Some ulama say, no, he did not know how to read and write. Most ulama of the Shia say, no, he knew but he never read and he never wrote. And the philosophy behind not reading and not writing is very simple. Because the people would say that all these teachings that he is bringing, he has read somewhere in some other text of some other people. And now he is bringing it to us. He has copied from some book. Now he is bringing it to us. But the Prophet never read. He never wrote. Interestingly, this is one of the arguments that the Orientalist scholars until today, they say that the Prophet of Islam, he took his teachings from the Jews, he took his teachings from the Christians. Until today, they bring this type of argument. It's when, when we read this verse, even the Quran, some people uh, quote some people saying this. In Surah Al-Furqan, Allah Azza wa Jal quotes some people, وَقَالُوا أساطير الأولين اكتتبها فهي تملى عليه بكرة وأصيلا. Some people they made this accusation from that time. It's even come in the Quran that these things that the Prophet is bringing to us are just stories that he has written down. Somebody must have dictated to him, and now he's just bringing it to us. So this accusation was made. Allah says that he never wrote, he never read. Now. One interesting point about this verse is وَلَا تَخُطُّهُ بِيَمِينِكَ Writing with the right hand. Does it mean that the Prophet was right-handed? Can we say from this one phrase of the verse that we can deduce? Because Allah says you never wrote with your right hand, it means the Prophet was right-handed. Can we deduce from this or not? The Prophet may have been right-handed, but from this phrase to deduce this might be problematic. Why? Because the scholars, the Mufassirin say that 
What it means is that it is giving an emphasis that he never used to write. Wala takhuttuhu biyaminik means you never wrote with your right hand, means you never used to write. You did not write with your right hand. When you make something more detailed, you are laying emphasis on it. Now whether you can actually deduce that the Prophet was right-handed from this or not, of course there might be some narrations that say that he was right-handed and therefore it might be correct. But this kind of deduction could be problematic. This is just to give you an idea. Some people who read verses, they take things literally, they don't understand the context and this is the type of deduction that they can come up with. بَلْ هُوَ آيَاتٌ بَيِّنَاتٌ فِي صُدُورِ الَّذِينَ أُوتُوا الْعِلْمُ وَمَا يَجْحَدُ بِآيَاتِنَا إِلَّا الظَّالِمُونَ No, the Prophet has not written this down. He has not copied it from any book. He has not taken it from anyone. These are verses that we have revealed. These are divine verses. And the only people who argue and are stubborn are the ظَالِمُونَ in the previous verse, we are told the only people who are stubborn are the kafirun. Now you can see the kafirun, the walimun, these are the groups of people who struggle against the message that is revealed by Allah Azza wa Jal. And the last verse we will deal with today, insha'Allah. وَقَالُوا لَوْ لَا أُنزِلَ عَلَيْهِ آيَةٌ مِّن رَبِّهِ قُلْ إِنَّمَا الْآيَاتُ عِنْدَ اللَّهِ وَإِنَّمَا أَنَا نَذِيرٌ مُبِينٌ Why has he not been given miracles and signs? The people asked. If indeed he is a prophet, why doesn't he have the ability of Isa alayhi salam to raise the dead back to life? Why doesn't he have the ability of Musa alayhi salam to split the river into two or to turn a stick into a snake? Where is his miracle where is his sign where are his extraordinary acts that make us believe in the fact that he is a prophet of course the prophet himself does not decide what miracle he will bring because he has to just establish the message of Allah Azza wa Jal he doesn't want to prove to them his prophecy only. He wants to prove to them the message of Allah Azza wa Jal is true. Therefore, he has to wait for the miracle that Allah sends down, not of his own accord. And therefore, when the people come and they say, show us this miracle, show us that miracle, Allah sent the best of miracles, which is the Quran, which is there with us until today. People wanted all sorts of miracles. They asked for different things. They said, oh Prophet, you should fly in the sky. Show us that you can fly. These are the kind of miracles they wanted from the Prophet. And if a person does not accept one miracle, you show him a thousand miracles, he will not accept. There is a narration in which Imam Ali alayhi salam says, Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. That the mushrikeen of Quraysh came to the Holy Prophet and they said, If you are indeed a Prophet, we want to see a special miracle from you. You see that tree over there? We want you to call the tree to us. So the Prophet prayed to Allah Azza wa Jal and that tree came out of its place and came towards the Prophet. They said, Okay, now we want you to take it back to where it was. The Prophet prays to Allah Azza wa Jal and the tree goes back to its original position. They are not satisfied. They say, now we want you to make half of the tree remain there and half of the tree come back, come towards us. The Prophet prays and, they, and this also happens but they still do not accept. The point is this, if you have a clean heart, one miracle is enough for you to accept in the prophecy of Rasulullah. You do not need all this different. And if you don't have that ability of accepting, no matter how many miracles the Prophet brings, you will not be able to accept and gain Iman. We pray to Allah Azza wa Jal to grant us the understanding of the Holy Quran in this month, which is the spring of the Quran, Rabi' al-Quran. 
so that we may implement the teachings in our daily lives and improve ourselves and attain the proximity of Allah Azza wa Jal. Rabbana taqabbal minna innaka anta al-sami'u al-alim wa tub alayna innaka anta al-tawab al-rahim bi rahmatika ya arham al-rahimin wa alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen wa sallallahu ala muhammadin wa alihi al-tahirin.